There's considerable work going on to find a vaccine for Ebola. But how would a vaccine help not just the individuals who are vaccinated, but the wider population? If there was a good vaccine, it would reduce the risk of disease in the individuals who are vaccinated. But it could also reduce transmission in the community. And it is this that's the focus of this lecture. The basic case reproduction number, R0, is the average number of secondary cases per case in a totally susceptible population. And we've said that R0 is greater than 1, the number of cases increases. If it's 1, it's stable. If it's less than 1, the cases decrease. And this is what we're aiming for. And we looked at the different ways of doing this through treatment, through barriers and distance, through isolation and quarantine. But the other thing to think about is the proportion of cases who are susceptible. R0 is the reproduction number at time zero when all are susceptible. The net case reproduction number is the reproduction number time t and it varies with the proportion who are still susceptible. So imagine an infection moving through a population. In this case, each case is infecting two more. The R0 would be two. Everybody is susceptible and acquiring the disease and passing it on. But supposing some people were immune, either naturally or because of a vaccine, the number of new cases is greatly reduced. Some of the people who would otherwise have acquired the infection are immune, they don't get ill, they don't pass it on to other people. So R, the net reproduction number, is R0 multiplied by the proportion susceptible. So another way of reducing the reproduction number, the average number of new cases arising per case, is to decrease the proportion susceptible. This will happen naturally to some extent, following immunity after infection. Survivors will have a degree of immunity, but you can also reduce it through vaccination. So we can work out how many people you'd need to make immune to get the R down to 1. And that would depend on the R0 that you start with. So, for example, if the R0 was 3, to get an R of 1, you'd need to make 3 minus 1 people immune. So the proportion would be 3 minus 1 divided by 3, or 67%. So in general, to get the R to 1, you'd need to make R0 minus 1 people divided by R0 immune. And that number is the herd immunity threshold. Formally, the herd immunity threshold is the proportion of the population that needs to be immune for a disease to become stable, to get R to 1, so that every case on average only gives rise to one new case. If the proportion immune is greater than the herd immunity threshold, R becomes less than 1 and the disease decreases. For trying to do this through vaccination, we have to remember that the proportion vaccinated is not the same as the proportion immune. The proportion vaccinated would only be the same as the proportion immune if vaccine efficacy were 100%. But unfortunately, that's never the case. It's always less than 100%. That's to say, not everyone who is vaccinated becomes fully immune. The vaccine efficacy is a measure of how good a vaccine is at preventing disease. It can be calculated by looking at the rate of disease in the unvaccinated and the rate of disease in the vaccinated. So the vaccine efficacy is the rate of disease in the unvaccinated minus the rate in the vaccinated, divided by the rate in the unvaccinated. It's the proportion of disease in the vaccinated that can be prevented by the vaccine. So we can put this together with the R0 to work out how many people you'd need to vaccinate to get an R of 1. So going back to our example, if the R0 is 3, the herd immunity threshold is 3 minus 1 divided by 3, or 67%. Now suppose you had a vaccine efficacy of 90%. The proportion to be vaccinated to make 67% immune to reach the herd immunity threshold will be 0.67 divided by the vaccine efficacy, 0.9, or 74%. So to get R less than 1, you need to vaccinate more than 74% of people. Of course, these sorts of calculations rely on several assumptions. An important one is that there's random mixing in the population that's never true. It's important to note also that the vaccine efficacy that's measured in clinical trials is always better than the vaccine effectiveness in practice. In practice, there may be problems with the way it's delivered, or the schedules not being adhered to completely, or problems with the cold chain. 
Nevertheless, these sorts of calculations are useful for working out the proportion of the population that would need to be vaccinated under different circumstances. So in this graph, we look at the proportion of the population you'd need to vaccinate, depending on the vaccine efficacy, along the bottom, and on what the R0 is. So if we start with an R0 of 2, we'll look at the proportion of the population we'd need to vaccinate, depending on the vaccine efficacy. And you can see if you had a vaccine efficacy of 50%, you'd need to vaccinate all of the population in order to get the R down to 1. As the vaccine efficacy improves, this proportion comes down, but is still high. However, if you can reduce R0 by other means, through the barriers and the isolation and so on, then the proportion of the population to have to vaccinate decreases, and you'd get away with a vaccine efficacy that was lower and a lower proportion of the population vaccinated to get your R down to 1. For Ebola, there are other practical issues to consider as well as the vaccine efficacy. There need to be trials of a vaccine and issues of who should these should be carried out on and how they would be done. When a vaccine is available, who should be vaccinated first? Should it be the whole population? How acceptable would a vaccine be? And there are likely to be issues with vaccine supply. If we're talking about whole population vaccine, you'd need very large numbers.